Welcome to the Deep End by On Deck, a podcast for visionary builders, creators, and thinkers discuss world-changing stories and ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kozlov. So the most intellectually difficult problems in the world today are not the ones that are actually going to have the biggest impact if you succeed at solving them. I mean, sometimes they are. Um, if something is a totally trivial thing to do and it would make a lot of people better off, somebody has probably already done it. But like, often things are not trivial, but not in the way that they're like a complicated math problem to solve. It's instead not trivial in the way of, for example, you have to train a team of thousands of people to go around throughout Senegal opening up agents and stuff like that. And it draws some amount of smart people, but I've seen a lot of smart people basically ignore that type of problem because they're like, I have a giant brain and I want to use it on problems that require a giant brain. And my point is, any problem, if you stare at it hard enough and use your entire brain to solve it, in my opinion, becomes pretty interesting. And if you do this with important problems instead of quote unquote hard problems, which are like intellectually difficult ones, then you will have a much bigger impact on the world. On Deck is where ambitious people worldwide go to start companies, find their next roles, and invest in their careers. The Deep End invites the founders, operators, and investors from the On Deck community and beyond to turn their experiences into the ideas others need to start their own odysseys. Joining me in the Deep End today is Ben Kuhn, the CTO at Wave, a mobile payment company whose mission is to make Africa the first cashless continent by building ways for unbaked people to send and save money. Our discussion today covers a wide variety of topics, everything from how going cashless can help lift people out of poverty to how social enterprises differ from tech companies to the surprising but rather obvious of respect point that soccer balls don't actually make good lamps. We also spent time deep diving into why startups should only spend their innovation points on things that directly impact the core business problem they're trying to solve and use boring solutions for other things. Ben's mental model for this is fascinating. The way he sees it, departures from the status quo are almost always more costly than people realize, so it's only worth doing when it's mission critical. For anyone interested in company building in emerging markets, the challenges and opportunities that come from building financial services in sub-Saharan Africa, or is just looking for valuable insights on building startups, you won't want to miss this conversation. Let's dive in. Ben Kuhn, welcome to The Deep End. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to speak with you too. I was just saying before we started the recording, I really enjoy your writing just on startups, life, the internet, but we're going to focus in on one specific area of your writing. It also relates to your actual day job and your work, but let's just actually start with your work. Like, who are you? What do you do? Help us understand like your role as a CTO. Uh, yeah, great. So I'm the CTO of a company called Wave, and uh, we build financial services for unbanked people in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, in like a lot of different countries in sub-Saharan Africa, people mostly do their various types of economic transactions with cash. And maybe if you've grown up in the US or another developed country, like it's not obvious how terrible that is, but it's actually really inconvenient and in fact, like dangerous in some ways. So for example, if you're like a fish trader and you, your business is you buy fish at a coastal fish market, you send them inland and then to a different fish market. And then the person who's receiving them like pays you back by sending cash back on the truck. If you're, if that's your business model, you're spending half of your time basically sitting around, sitting on your hands, waiting for that cash to come back to you. And because you're in a low income country, you, you can't just, you, you know, get a loan for this or, or whatever. That is like your cash. That's the only cash you've got. And so you're wasting half of your time waiting for cash to, to come to you on a bus. Or maybe you're even, you're one step ahead of that and you're using some money transfer service, but most of them aren't good at like making sure that the pickup point has enough cash for you. And so even so, you'll still be stuck waiting around for to, to get that cash. 
And there are lots. And so as a result of that, you literally are making half as much income as you could if that transfer were instant. So there are a lot of different economic problems like this that lack of financial services causes. And as a result, if you look at uh, the rollout of good electronic financial services in various countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you can actually find really large effects on poverty reduction when these services roll out. So the, the best studies have been done on one that's called M-Pesa in Kenya, which was sort of the original one. And they estimated that as a result of the M-Pesa rollout, over 1% of households in the country were lifted out of poverty, which is sort of like an astonishingly large effect. It's over a million people in Kenya alone. And we're trying to have that impact through the rest of sub-Saharan Africa by building the financial services that really should exist and don't currently. Okay, that's really interesting. You've said a million different things I'm going to pick up on. So we're going to go in a not quite directed order here. So Great. like you said, M-Pesa is the initial one. It's in Kenya. I think most people in the tech industry know of a generic story. It's transferred through mobile phones, all that different bit. That seems like a very 2000 story. But like you said, that was the initial bit. What changed in the 2010s? Like, what's the gap between the narrative we know and the space you're describing now? That's a great question. And actually, I think it's a pretty interesting story what happened. So M-Pesa succeeded really well in Kenya. But when uh, other people tried to bring this model to other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they really didn't succeed as well. And... We discovered this when we were building our, our first product, which we, we started building international money transfer first, sending money from the US to Kenya. And when we tried to expand to other countries, we realized, okay, well, our M-Pesa integration works great. And like our US to Kenya product succeeded wildly because of that. It very quickly got to the point where we had basically all the Kenyans in the US using it. Um, but we couldn't deliver as good of an experience in other countries because the mobile money systems in those countries were not as good. Their agent networks wouldn't cover everywhere that people wanted to be able to withdraw money. Their customer support would be worse. They would have unplanned maintenance for four hours every Friday during the peak time, AKA we didn't buy enough servers. Um, and so they were just executing way worse on, on many dimensions. And so it's a bit of a, like there are many possible reasons this could be. We don't have a definitive answer to this, but I have, a, I think, a pretty strong hypothesis, which is that the in in Kenya, M-Pesa was run as sort of a startup within Safaricom that benefited from a lot of benign neglect as it was growing. Whereas in all of these other markets, it was sorry, the telecoms. What's Safaricom? Oh, I'm sorry. Safaricom is the telecom that operated M-Pesa in Kenya. Um, so M-Pesa was run as an internal startup within the telecom that operated it, and the telecom overall was sort of just ignoring it. In the other countries, they were trying to launch a copycat product of this thing that already worked. And so the way it usually worked was they took some VP and they were like, hey, you, you're in charge of mobile money now. So the VP would go and like procure this like multi-million dollar software system from Ericsson or Huawei, and then they would like deploy it. And it would be this like big rollout. But these telecoms, they never, for a lot of them, this was their first complicated user-facing product they had ever shipped. And they just didn't execute very well on it in lots and lots of different ways. And like, you know, if you've bought this software from Ericsson or Huawei and you want to change it, you have to like file a change ticket and wait for months for an engineer to pick it up. And they often didn't have the logistical expertise in managing the cash that was going around that network of agents where you deposit or withdraw. And uh, because it was mainly the telecoms doing this and they were just not good at executing, the market sort of stagnated outside of, of, of Kenya. So the thing that's changed, and the reason for this, by the way, um, the reason it was the telecoms initially is that before smartphones became ubiquitous, only telecoms could build this software in a way that it would work on feature phones. So there's a particular protocol called USSD, um, which uh, you can use to allow a feature phone to communicate with whatever random application. So you, you dial a string of digits and your phone sends a message to the telecom and the telecom sends a message back to you and it pops up in like a pop-up box. 
And in, in principle, anyone can use USSD, but it's access to it is controlled by the telecom. And so if the telecom decides we want a monopoly on mobile money, they're going to get one. They can just sort of sabotage anyone else who tries to build a USSD based mobile money service. And so the thing that Wave is taking advantage of, the change that Wave is taking advantage of is we can now build a smartphone first mobile money service because enough people in the countries that we operate in now have access to smartphones. It's not everybody, but it's close enough that we can build this smartphone first based thing without being gate kept by the telecoms. And because we are also much better at executing on all of the dimensions that telecoms are executing at, we're succeeding where they failed at basically building good financial services for people in other countries. I was really interested in your use of the word term unbanked instantly mm -hmm. brought to mind thoughts of crypto and, you know, that sort of opportunity there existing financial institutions. Just what do you, what do you think about that bit? Because it's just interesting that people who talk about the opportunity from an altruistic perspective will often use language that you're similarly using. Is the question, what do I think about crypto? Or no, no, not, not what do you think about crypto? Okay. Just sort of like, what is the, what is the opportunity do you think around unbanked persons? Because oftentimes people will say that like, for example, something Bitcoin, if there, if there aren't banks, if there isn't like an established financial infrastructure, Bitcoin, crypto, et cetera, provides an opportunity for those type of spaces. So I'm just curious how you think about that space. Um, do you, do you want me to talk about crypto or not? I can give you my, like, how long of a rant do you want? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could go as this is the deep end. You could go. You could go as long as you want to go. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So I, I think mm, I would say we're not really thinking about it in terms of, uh, I guess, like a market opportunity or like you know how can we apply crypto to this like space or whatever. We are thinking about it in terms of like there's a bunch of people whose lives kind of suck in various ways because. Nobody is providing them with what, in my opinion, is like a blindingly obvious thing to provide them with, which is, you know, an app that adds and subtracts numbers for them. Um, and uh, so uh, our our goal, we, we, we see, you know, there's a problem. We can build a thing that solves it. Uh, and we're primarily motivated by that, not something like, oh, there's an opportunity to extract X million dollars from like this thing. Wait, of course, we are trying to build a profitable business because that's the best way to scale it quickly and the best way to keep it sustainable in the long term. But uh, and I, I, I can I don't know, I can give you like back of the envelope calculations about market size or whatever if you want. But I think that's not primarily how I think about it or how other people at Wave think yeah. about it. No, and, and that's in, that's entirely fair. Another, like I said, we're going to throw a bunch of random questions at you. Great. I'd love to hear you talk more about sub-Saharan Africa. We did a episode on emerging markets focused on the African continent, but as you and basically anyone knows, referring to the African continent as one market is not particularly helpful. The guest we had though on is focused on Nigeria. So like that's mm -hmm. one specific angle on it. I'd love for you to talk about sub-Saharan Africa and how you conceive of the region. How I conceive of the region. I think, I don't think this is a great question for me to answer. Cause like, I mean, at least compared to my coworkers, right? I like, uh, I mostly try to avoid having big galaxy brain thoughts about how to conceive of sub Saharan Africa. I don't think that's like, with a, per a person with as little context as me, should not be trying to have those thoughts. Um, and oh, fair. Let me re ask the question then. What I more yeah. mean is, so like you said, like the, there were aspects of Kenya that made M-Pesa like financially viable and created an opportunity. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at the sub-Saharan region mm -hmm. within the context of the work that you guys are doing, mm -hmm. how do you think of the opportunities given that context? Uh, yeah, I think so. Luckily for us, uh, the thing that we're trying to build, I think, is I would say pretty straightforward. As I said, it's an app that adds and subtracts numbers. And even though there are a lot of differences in how people how people behave culturally, how people want to interact with the world across all of these different countries, the process of adding and subtracting numbers to provide financial services is 
relatively similar. It's not exactly the same, but like what people want out of a mobile money app is relatively similar across these various regions. And I think that's a big advantage to us. Obviously, there are many differences. The one that requires the most work for us, for example, is people, there are different uh, utility companies that people want to pay their bills for and stuff. So we have to adapt that. There are also different currencies that, uh, you know, get subdivided in various ways. And we, we have to um, adapt that. And as we build more complex financial products, I think we'll probably have to do more of this. So if you're just sending money from point A to point B, that works the same everywhere. But if you're, for example, trying to provide people with credit, the payment terms that people might want, the repayment terms for your credit are much more likely to be different or have different conventions and different reasons. And so that's something that we'll have to like adapt more as, as we ship that feature like across a, a large region. But for the basic product, fortunately for us, it can work at a high level similarly everywhere. I've really enjoyed one of your essays. It's called Why and How to Start a Startup Serving Emerging Markets. And just to pull a quote from it, you say, Wave's mission is to improve the world, not to make money. Despite that, we operate more like a tech company than a social enterprise. What do you really mean by that? Like, What's the difference between a social enterprise and a tech company? Uh, great question. So I don't want to spend too much time shitting on social enterprises, but I guess I'll talk about what I think we've imported from other tech companies that has been really healthy and beneficial to us. Most of which I think is like a laser focus on making our product so great that it achieves product market fit and becomes really easy to grow and scale on its own, which basically that means is your product good enough that people tell other people about it. It's really easy to get people to use the product and it's really easy to get people to keep using it once they're using it. Um, so that type of focus, focus on basically user growth and retention is very typical for tech companies. And I think is a really good proxy for Basically, are you building a truly amazing product that really just works for your users? And I think it's easy to tell, if you're not focusing on those things, it's easy to tell yourself a story about why you're not growing or your retention sucks, but you're still doing good things anyway. But if you want to build a really great product that changes the lives of a large number of users, you really have to make sure that you get those two things right. And so I think that alignment between what investors want to see and what are the right goals for us to have from the point of view of impact is really useful. And you seem like a good faith person, so I don't need you to just, you know, shit on social enterprise, but, you know, just thinking about the space, like what are some weaknesses or challenges facing social enterprise? I think that's a good set of euphemisms <laughs> that can give an answer to that question. I would say I'm not very familiar with the space. And so I don't have a super good answer to this sort of, or at least not an answer for like the good kind of social enterprise. I can tell you many stories about like, you know, the people who tried to build a soccer ball that was also a lamp that was recharged by kicking the soccer ball. And it's like, well, that sounds like a very clever idea. But then if you actually think about it for 30 seconds, it turns out that a soccer ball with a bunch of charging equipment inside it is not a very good soccer ball. And a lamp that you kick around all the time is not a very good lamp. And if you try to put the two of them together, it's more expensive than giving somebody a soccer ball plus a solar powered lamp, for example. So there's I don't know, there's a sort of like. Whoa, whoa. Okay, Ben, uh, you <laughs> only YouTube people will see this. I am smiling with delight because that is such a great story. You've got a bunch of these stories. Throw Because also, I love the way you put it in the sense of, if you think about it, a, lamp, a bad lamp and a terrible soccer ball. Just like, yeah, just what are, what are some, that, that's, that's, that's really interesting. That's also interesting at a design level. You have to kind of, yeah. you have to like think about it in like beyond just like the obvious point there. Yeah. So that's 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 one example of a sort of what I think of as people trying to be way too clever and maybe instead of starting from having deep experience on the ground of like observing problems that people actually face, 
They're, they instead come at it from the perspective of what can I build that seems clever and like it could plausibly solve a problem. So uh, the soccer this, the soccer ball example is one thing. I think there's a really there's a really famous uh, story of a thing called play pumps where somebody tried to build a thing that was a combination water pump and merry go round. And again, like it turns out that like people don't like the merry-go-round like is a lot higher friction to push around than like a water pump is to pump. And people don't really want to be forced to like push around this giant merry-go-round while they're, they just want some water for their family. Um, and like kids don't want water randomly spraying out of the middle of their merry-go-round. Um, and these things were like super unreliable and, and made everyone very sad. Uh, so and if they had been trying to charge money for this, I'm sure they would have immediately received a very strong market signal that nobody wanted that. And so I guess that's sort of that level of discipline that it trying to build a product that succeeds on its own merits and forces upon you seems healthy. This also dovetails well with what you said about how at a core level, Wave is numbers adding and subtracting and sending them and how actually just something so simple actually speaks to something that's definitely more useful than, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to laugh because once again, like it's water, it's people's lives, but there's something particularly hellish about the merry-go-round to pump water that actually takes much more work. Uh, but it seems like something that like, in, like, th like, that seems like something that an evil, sadistic person would design to punish people. But obviously, to your point, that doesn't come from badness. It comes from just sort of over trying to be too clever. I think, I think, I think, I think avoiding being too clever is just good advice for startups in general. Oh, it sure is. I think this is something that we try to do across a large number of different dimensions, not just in our business plan, you know, build an agent network, build the app that adds and subtracts numbers question mark profit, but also technically also in how we organize ourselves. There's a very famous programming essay called use boring technology, which basically goes through this and explains why you should not use any cutting edge things because it's not well understood. You, if, if you're trying to also build like a successful business and you don't have a very strong rationale for doing this, you should not try to use cutting edge technology unless it is directly attacking a problem that's like incredibly important for your business and you have a strong rationale for why you can't use something else because the failure modes of it are not well understood and you're you're going to have a really hard time dealing with the fallout of that and i think this applies not to, just to technology but also for example use boring organizational structures do not try to build a large company with no managers uh, this, I think, was a common fad in maybe like 2010 through 2016 or something. People would talk about how they had a flat company with no managers. And it, it turns out that, that when you do this, the result is usually chaos and a lot of sadness. And instead, you should have managers like almost every successful company ever. And I mean, you can decide not to have managers if you think that's a direct attack on a core problem for your company, but know that you're, I guess, you're spending innovation points on that, that you could be spending on, for example, figuring out how to build a massive network of money transfer agents in Senegal or whatever actual problem you're trying to solve is. You know, that's what you're describing with the management hierarchy brings to mind Zappos, you know, Zappos did this um, in the 2010s in terms of the the, the flat hierarchy. And I'm curious because I want to spend some time on this management theory stuff because it's actually super heady and really interesting. Do you think mm -hmm. that there is a, a difference between a, once again, Zappos, post-acquisition by Amazon, mm -hmm. we're going to launch this management theory experimentation and Zappos, the startup, right? So like, is there, is there, is there like a dichotomy there and how you should think about um, – because you don't want to, I don't want people to necessarily think the point here is that the status quo always works. But I think there's something about stage here that gets at what you're talking about. Um, I would say I think it's less about stage and more about you need to be very deliberate in which ways you decide to fight or to opt out of the status quo. Like it is more costly than you think it's going to be. Um, and that doesn't mean you should never do it, but it means that you should think very carefully about whether 
the thing, the way in which you're trying to do it is important enough to be worth investing all of the energy and time and attention in supporting your innovative decision that you wouldn't have to if you chose to roll with the status quo. So in the case of Zappos, I don't really know enough about how Zappos works internally to say for sure, but I will bet you that their management experiment, if it to the extent that it worked, required a lot of time and effort and ongoing investment from lots of people in order to debug all of the problems with it and figure out how to implement holacracy properly or whatever, um, that instead, if they had decided to have a normal management structure, they those people could have spent that time focusing on Zappos's business problems. And without context on Zappos, I don't want to say whether it was the right or wrong decision for them, of course. Like, you know, maybe it was the right decision because of a combination of, you know, what people were there, what problems they were trying to solve or, or something like that. I would just point out, like, the costs of diverging, the, the, the costs of that decision for them were probably large. And in general, if you choose to diverge from the status quo, the cost of that decision to you are likely to be pretty large, larger than you might expect originally. And so you should be really thoughtful about about where you try to do that. So an example of this from uh, from Wave, for example, is that uh, we are fully transparent internally with what our salaries are um, and the equity that we, we give to our employees. And we chose to do this when we were very small uh, because we thought transparency and honesty was really important and it would ensure that we were held accountable to be fair in how we compensated people. And it's achieved those goals, but it also has... Uh, especially as we've scaled it, a lot more costs than we anticipated in some ways. For example, uh, in Senegal, the way that people think about compensation culturally is different. And when we were fully transparent about everyone's salaries for like our local business in Senegal, that caused a lot of friction and uh, like confusion and concerns among the team because... I think people were less used to that level of transparency and uh, it like caused a lot more conflict than it did when we did that with our remote team. And so we ended up having to slightly walk that back, I think, in Senegal, where I think we're still transparent about what people's level is, but we don't make it as easy to figure out what, what people's like role and, and title and, and compensation level is. And we still have a formula to compute people's salary based on that, but we've made it harder to literally scan the spreadsheet of all people's salary and equity. Um, another way in which it's had costs is, for example, uh, we can't, uh, it, it is much harder for us to land particular candidates because we cannot negotiate. Um, and so if we make a, a wrong decision in our salary equity formula, we can sometimes really impair our ability to hire people that it's really important for us to hire. A third way is it's really hard for us to experiment with uh, or to understand like how our salary equ and equity choices influence the type of candidates that we can uh, that we can get excited about wave because we can't we tell everyone what their offer will be very early on in the process, like often in the job description itself, because we can do that because it's a formula. But this causes people to read the job description and then never apply if we wouldn't be meeting their salary expectations. And we simply have no idea how large that group of people is. So anyway, I think this was like a good decision on net for us, but, and I, I, I still endorse it, but we are definitely, we are spending a lot of innovation tokens on supporting this system. Um, and, uh, so that's the kind of phenomenon that I'm talking about when I say know when you're deciding to do something that's not boring and be thoughtful about whether it is worth doing for you. And to stick with your really useful rubric here and to put a pin on this for the audience, what problem do you think Wave was solving when it made salaries transparent and prevented negotiations? So I don't think we had the mental model of we need to be very clear about what problem we're solving when we made this decision. Um, 
to be clear. And I don't know if I would remake the decision the same way today. Uh, I think I I think I probably would because it I think it has turned out to be an important part of something that's culturally very important to wave, which is um, a very strong focus on being honest and transparent with each other. I think that's really I think that's really important because wave is a place where uh, everyone everyone who works here is working here for the same reason, which is they're really excited about our mission. And that helps us have a very aligned, internally aligned team. If you talk to anyone else at Wave and you if you have a disagreement with them, it's probably not because, for example, their OKRs are different from your OKRs and they're optimizing for their OKRs and you're optimizing for your OKRs and you're just now going to have a pitched battle. It's because they think one thing is best for users and you think a different thing is best for users. And if the two of you sit down in a room, you will probably figure out what is actually best for users and then you'll both be happy to do that. Um, anyway, so I think like given that we have that type of environment, we are able to be really honest and transparent and have people be happy and okay with that in a way that is often not the case if there's a lot of like internal conflict. And um, that type of honesty and transparency is really great for people. It makes them feel like they understand what's going on. They can be confident that we're not uh, compensating them unfairly compared to other people at Wave. Um, and like, so that has a lot of great knock on effects in terms of the overall environment. People are just really happy to be like honest with each other. Um, and I think that helps us like improve a lot as, as a company and give people like good feedback and stuff like that. So, and I, I think the level of transparency that we have with, with salaries and stuff is, is an important part of that, but I don't know if I would have predicted how this would turn out if I had been thinking about, is this going to solve an important problem for us when, when we made that decision, which actually was before my time. I'm not a founder of wave. I was an early employee. Um, and by that time we were already, we already had this salary transparency thing in place and we've kept it ever since. Something I'd like to really end this on is, like I said at the start, I've really enjoyed your writing and I've really enjoyed honestly interviewing you to hear your thought process. And, and, and a piece you wrote that I think it just really stuck out, A, because it's a good title, but B, just kind of resonates, is this piece you wrote called You Don't Need to Work on Hard Problems. And that one's interesting because it's counterintuitive to, I think, a lot of narratives that whether you're technical or not, you're probably hearing. So I'm just curious for you to just basically give us a preview or articulation of what your argument is, like what you were seeing in the world that inspired you to write that piece. I think the thing that inspired me the most to write this piece. So um, before I worked at Wave, I was a I studied math at Harvard and I had a lot of friends who were studying math or computer science or some other quote unquote like hard subject. And when you're in that environment, so how are you rewarded? You're rewarded by getting A's in classes. And if you are good enough that that's easy for you, the way that you get rewarded more is you take harder classes and also get an A in those classes. And so the way that most people were incentivized throughout their schooling up until that point was basically to find the hardest problems they could and then get an A on solving them. Unfortunately, this is really different from the way the real world works. So in the real world, you are not graded on a scale from zero to 100. On a real, in the real world, you are graded on a scale from, for example, if you're thinking about uh, the number, the amount of like happiness that you've created for people, uh, you're graded on a scale of zero or, you know, you, you could go negative, but ignoring that for a second, zero to, you know, billions of happier in some sense people. And that's a much wider range. Um, and so like people's intuitions that they form when they're looking for hard problems to get an A on are really maladapted for this world in which you instead want to focus on basically what are the things that are actually going to produce the best outcome on this extremely power law e 
if you succeed, you will make millions or billions of people better off scale. And often those things are actually not the same in the way that school teaches you to think that they are the same. So the most intellectually difficult problems in the world today are not the ones that are actually going to have the biggest impact if you succeed at solving them. I mean, sometimes they are. Um, if something is a totally trivial thing to do and it would make a lot of people better off, somebody has probably already done it. But like, often things are not trivial, but not in the way that they're like a complicated math problem to solve. It's instead not trivial in the way of, for example, you have to train a team of thousands of people to go around throughout Senegal opening up agents and stuff like that. And that's sort of not the kind of problem that draws a lot of, well, it draws some amount of smart people, but I've seen a lot of smart people basically ignore that type of problem because they're like, I have a giant brain and I want to use it on problems that require a giant brain. And my point is any problem, if you stare at it hard enough and use your entire brain to solve it, in my opinion, becomes pretty interesting. And if you do this with important problems instead of quote unquote hard problems, which are like intellectually difficult ones, then you will have a much bigger impact on the world. Man, that is a great place to leave it, especially because what really resonates with what you just said there too, is that it, it, it often feels as if the harder problems are just more significant and actually I'm seriously I've got 10 different things flashing before my eyes right now that are actually very simple and actually are pretty significant, yet it's easy to just push them off because of this instinct towards the harder, the bigger, that 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 different bits. So I, I appreciate the personal advice there too, even though I'm non-technical, so I'm not quite, my problems are more podcast related, but I think there's definitely something there wisdom wise. So yeah, that makes ben, sense. This has been, th th this has been really great. Um, just once again, since you're 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 a writer, um, do you have any other pieces you'd like to shout out for the uh, audience to check out if they want to dive a little deeper? Well, uh, so I would suggest going to benkuhn.net. That's b-e-n-k-u-h-n.net, and there's a list of basically what I feel like are the posts that I'm most happy with that I've written, and you can go down and and see which ones of them speak to you, and hopefully there will be some. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's a separate list on that side of the ones that I think have really stood the test of time. And that's where I would Ooh, suggest going. You set yourself more. up there and I'm going to ask you, what is a essay of yours that has not stood the test of time and has been taken off the front page of your website? Uh, so the way it works is that there's a recent column on the right and, uh, non-recent call and then things get promoted to the the big font column so I'm gonna I think I think I wouldn't say that any of mine have specifically not stood the test of time but that's sort of the, de the default outcome is they fall off the recent column if they're not they're not recent enough <laughs> that's a that's a good way of putting it well Ben thank you for joining us on the show I've really enjoyed speaking with you about everything from wave to emerging markets to how we should think about different types of problems Thanks so much. It was these were really great questions and uh, I really enjoyed talking to you.